CNF Worldwide for nomads everywhere. What's going on out there, nomads? This is Jason from CNF Worldwide, and we are at the Home Brewers Association in Boulder, Colorado, and we're sitting here with Millie Schamberger and Duncan Bryant. We'd like to thank you for joining us here today. Thank Absolutely. you very much for welcoming yeah. us into your building, setting us up on this beautiful patio. This is awesome. Um, so I guess this kind of developed rather quickly. Um, it sure did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the backstory on that, because it was pretty interesting. So Rick, who if you watch CNF videos at all, you are familiar with, was in Alabama. Gulf, Al Gulf Shores, Gulf Coast, Alabama yeah. at Big Beach. Correct. And he met a gentleman who just happens to be... My dad. Your... <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I think he spread the word that I'm involved with the Homebrewers Association here in Colorado, and then it all just happened. If I, that just so happened that you were out west, <laughs> too. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. It just <laughs> happened that way, yeah. Get into the meat and potatoes of all this stuff here. Yes. Um, so you, both of you, or with the Home Brewers Association, yep. part of the Brewers Association. So we start with, like, what's the origin story, if you will, like sure. the founding of the yeah. Home Brewers Association? So we started in 1978. Charlie Papazian and Charlie Matson um, kicked things off with the very first issue of Zymergy Magazine. So that's our... Uh -huh. uh, birthday. Yep, that's our birthday, <laughs> December 7th. So um, that came on the heels of Jimmy Carter legalizing homebrewing basically ah. so on the federal level there was a bill and it got added on that homebrewing making beer at home will be legal at the federal level um, so that passed in 78 and then it didn't go in effect till 79 so our first issue went out in 78 but really homebrewing didn't become legal until February 1st the following year so there was a little little gray area there but um, up until that point you know they weren't they didn't just start brewing on december 7th you know they had a group of people here in boulder where we're still based and they just learned how to make beer and their goal was to push the envelope and figure out different flavor combinations and different styles that weren't readily available in liquor stores at the time and you know see what they could make of it and how they could put their own twist on it and then you know, that grew into the AHA, which launched, and, you know, that was mostly a, an educational uh, kind of thing, teaching people how to make beer, putting on some conferences and whatnot. But then we kind of uh, grew into an organization that helps uh, bring about fair use homebrew laws in, in states. So, excellent. Yes. yes. So, yeah, it was federally legalized, but that doesn't mean anything if it's still seen as illegal in your state. Very true, still applicable today. Exactly. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> still working Absolutely. on it. Absolutely. <laughs> right, so, you know, <laughs> prohibition ended in 1933, winemaking was legalized, but they forgot to mention beer. And that was basically like the, the little issue that happened and, and left it off of the federal law. Jimmy Carter passed it. Well, now there's 50 states that need to adopt the laws. Some of them were just like, okay, we're going to take the federal law word for word, apply it to our state, we're good to go, you're allowed to make beer. Other states, it took 30, 40 years. So it wasn't until 2013 that the last two states to legalize it, Mississippi and Alabama, did so and so that was that it was 2013 <laughs> when all 50 states finally recognized homebrewing as being legal and yeah like can you imagine i was <laughs> genuinely like, really yeah 2013 yes. 2013 okay wow technically i bought my dad because i'm from alabama as we just talked about right bought my dad a homebrew kit before <laughs> it was legal <laughs> So we're here with yeah. criminals today on CNF. <laughs> Not <Worldwide>. me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so, so that you know, it took 40, 50 years to get to that point, and then yeah, it's legal in all 50 states now. But we're still running into issues where. Uh, you know, I might not be able to bring my homebrew to a, uh, a homebrew club to share. You know, you're not legally allowed to take it out of your house, or you're not legally allowed to share it with someone who's not your family. So, yeah, mm -hmm. we, we, we helped facilitate the legalization of all 50 states, but there's still a lot of groundwork to make up to make it so it's not, you don't have to look over your shoulder if you're trying to right. you know, share yeah. a beer with a friend. And a lot of these things, people, like I assume you just did, assumed all this stuff is already legal and okay. and you know, it's Absolutely. very much in a, in, a, in a gray area, but there are some some states out there where it's still 
you know, we can't hold our conference there because of the laws there. Which or, we were just talking about. Right, yeah, right. which is why associations like this are absolutely still necessary. Right. To be the, you know, a central voice for the larger community of exactly. people out there. As 2013, that just wrecked me. I have, I, yeah. I did not know that at all. That is very interesting. And that was, that was my first year working here. So it's like, Hey, we did it. But like <laughs> our boss, Gary, the director of the Homebrewers Association, you know, this was something he's been passionately working on for you know, 20, 20 years. years. <laughs> so like to him, you know, that, that was like a, like a lifelong worth of work. <laughs> and, and, and to be clear, you know, it wasn't just the AHA doing this. We worked very closely with local homebrew clubs, um, craft brewing guilds and, and groups awesome. like that. So, you know, it's not just us going in there and being like, hey, here's what we're doing. This is it's, what you're going to do. Right. Yeah. It's very Mobilize. much a collaborative yeah. effort yeah. with both homebrewers and professionals and making sure that what we end up with is what we want and it won't actually turn around and bite us in the butt, which is what we established. Let's say that rising tide raises all ships yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. right. Just, exactly. just, you know, get it done so we can keep this moving mm -hmm. and right. growing the, the mm -hmm. segments. Yeah. Yep. Wow. So let's uh, as you do specifically what, how did you come to start working here let's start with millie so um i moved to colorado three years ago and before that i had spent the past six months helping my folks open their brewery in south alabama a big beach brewing company um i was home brewing with my dad learning as much as possible about beer in general the biz and the process and I wanted to come out here because I needed to change. I was frankly tired of the Southern heat. And, um, and here I am, I, I applied to a job at the HA and um, now I'm, I started out as an administrative assistant. Now I'm the business programs coordinator. So nice. my job is supporting homebrew supply shop. So when we talked about this whole legislative piece, they play a huge role in that yes. as well. Um, mobilizing shops because they have an incentive to you know promote commerce in their communities True. is really really important so that's largely what I do at the HA and that's how I got involved in beer excellent <laughs> I've been here a while longer um, I started as an intern actually so I was working 20 hours a week for eight months just out of college living the dream <laughs> working at the Home Brewers <laughs> Association and then um, you know during that time Homebrewing was really growing and, and our membership, you know, was, was really starting to go up and uh, our staff was growing as well. So a uh, position opened up for uh, doing more educational resources online, really uh, building up our website and what we have to offer. So I uh, got hired as the web editor in 2013. And then just recently, I'm now the associate director. So. Um, hoo, hoo, hoo. Oh, wow. Um, so bow down, yeah. Should have <laughs> just kidding. I would have worn a tie. It would have been tied right, but it would have been over right. somewhere. Yes. Maybe as a headband, Rambo style. Yeah. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome place to work. Wow. And it's, you know, for us, it's all about our members and what we can do to, you know, support them and promote the hobby. Promote the hobby. Promote yeah. the hobby. Because yes, it immediately comes to mind their homebrew shop in Baltimore. They um, recently transitioned from just homebrew shop to craft brewery as well mm. yeah. so they spent so many years you know supplying mm -hmm. being the supplier to all the homebrew communities and they're right next to another large brewery in baltimore so like the natural progression right once they found the real estate it was boom let's yeah. go let's do this and and well and these shop owners have been brewing beer for a long time a lot of times they're like the pioneers in home brewing for their communities a lot of them have been a lot of shops have been in business for a while i mean we're seeing you know less brick and mortar shops just because unfortunately the state of retail is online but True. um with that said um a lot of shops are looking to alternative revenue streams like opening you know small breweries because people can shop and get interested in the hobby and drink beer at the same time we actually we have a local our homebrew shop older fermentation supply you know started as a homebrew shop very small and they recently opened vision quest brewing and oh good nice they make some of my favorite beer like yeah. without a doubt you know adam and greg who work there who have been selling me homebrew ingredients for years, years. now yeah. and you know sharing their recipes it's like of course they should be professional brewers they're really great at it yeah but at the same time They've you know there's, home there's people like us who you know it's it's very much a hobby so you know for some people the progression isn't necessarily being like i need to have a tap room and I need to get my bottles in restaurants. You know, we actually had this conversation earlier. It's for some people, it's like hobbies enough. We'll leave it at that. You know, labor of love. It doesn't have to be that. <laughs> yeah. Once it turns into work, right, there's a whole different right, dynamic right. in that relationship. Exactly. Totally. 
Oh my Keep God. The, the passion's got to be there. Yeah. <laughs> so we would touch on, um, you briefly touched on it already, but like the, um, the magazine. Yep. Um, how do you pronounce it again? Zymergy. <laughs> there we go. Zymergy. <laughs> Zymergy. <laughs> we hear Zymergy. We're here. Zymergy. Yeah. It's, it's Zymergy. Zymergy. Um, so, which is uh, the science of fermentation, essentially. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was first issue was in 1978, and we now do six issues a year. Comes with membership. Um, okay. We now have a digital membership, too, so you can access all issues back through the year 2000. So, it's oh, really thanks. growing into a really, really badass library of Ooh. homebrewing resources but it's also really fun to kind of go through like go look at a recipe from the year 2000 yeah. and see like how things have changed or hey this ingredient might not be available anymore or, hey and now I should be using this instead that'd be a lot easier um, Ooh, so it's fantastic. also kind of like a yeah, fun timeline to go through of seeing the progression of trends and techniques and things like that in the actual hobby. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And each year we publish the National Homebrew Competition winning recipes mm -hmm. too. So that's very much kind of a cult following for yeah. homebrewers. They want to, you know, make sure that they're making really great recipes. And all of our recipes are awesome, but mm -hmm. those just happen to be gold <laughs> medal. Tried and true, baby. Yeah. <laughs> no bias, just facts. Yes. Exactly. I mean, doing. most of them, they're, they're coming from that we have online are being featured in Zymergy, their national homebrew competition, or their local BJCP competition winners, or they're coming from authors and things like that. So we do try to make sure that everything we put up there is not just like me being like, this sounds like it'd be good. Yeah. Try it. But, you know, <laughs> these are all tried and true and good stuff. Is, this, are you, is there any affiliation between the association and the BJCP? So we, we, uh, we support the BJCP. Okay. Um, we sanction uh, competitions as the AHA and the BJCP, so any BJCP competition is also an AHA sanctioned competition. We help facilitate um, exams. Exams, yeah. So like they'll send all the exams to us, and our we digitize them. Admin assistant cool. will scan them all. So we're just trying to take Gosh. some of the stuff off their plate, so they can be getting more judges in the pipeline, and you know that way we can have more competitions, more events, and things like that. But. The but they're hugely helpful. I mean, a lot of like Gordon Strong has spoken at our conferences, oh, nice. and um, I mean, there are many of us on staff that are BJCP certified judges, and um, just having that, them as a sort of third-party body that helps us add some sort of authority to the competitions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really great opportunity too for homebrewers to get feedback by entering into these competitions. So they're they're entering their beers in the competitions. They're being judged, and they then get those results back, and they're able to improve upon that recipe based on their feedback from. And I ask because we were just in Livingston, Montana, uh -huh. and had the opportunity to film Beer Maven 101. Cool. With um, this is a combination uh, uh, Fermentana LLC, and uh, they also do uh, uh, one, Jesse, who co runs the Fermentana, is also the Pink Boots chapter up there. Oh, very um, cool. And but Loy, who actually gave an amazing presence, shout out to Loy. Hey, how you doing? Um, <laughs> she led the, the evening and gave, literally it was beer 101. These are the ingredients. This is how you taste everything. But she's either just completed or about to go through her, her completion ah. to become a judge in BJCP. So I'm going like, okay, I need to know everything I can about yeah. how you're doing this. And it's just, it's very incredible, the amount of oh, there's research. there's a lot. And, I'm doing that right now. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying firsthand experience, firsthand knowledge right here. Yeah. yeah. I can not even imagine, because I'm. Uh, we have a sister who did sommelier. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And then some friends who did Cicerone, yep. but then I saw the BJCP material uh, comparatively, right. and it was, I don't want to say it was crazy amount, but it was just It's so a lot more technical. It focuses much more on brewing targets. process, and while the Cicerone exam definitely does touch on brewing process, the BJCP exam, like I said, is really, it's they're using these exams as a tool to get feedback. So you as a judge, it's your responsibility to, if something doesn't taste off, or, or if, some, if something does taste off, or it's not to style, you can then offer a suggestion like using a little less Vienna malt or you know, whatever the case may be. Yeah, they're, they're establishing the sort of the expectation of what a judge should be able to do so it's not just a bunch of, hey, I drink beer, I can give you <laughs> some feedback, and then yeah. who knows if, you know, the, the quality of of the feedback you're getting because then you can't act on it. But really a lot of people, like Millie said, are entering competitions so that they can 
brew that same recipe again and get closer to perfection. Practice makes perfect. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah, that's pretty much how it goes. <laughs> like, speaking of competitions, my next question is just the about the structure of mm -hmm. those competitions. So we know the judges, if it's a sanction, if, I mean, I'm assuming there's a sanctioning process. Yeah. If you have, you just so, register it. So once it's registered, then the judges should be then be from the BJCP certified. Exactly. And then, so how do like, if we could dive a little bit into that about the structure of the sure. competitions mm -hmm. and. Just BJC com BJCP competitions in general. Or, or just competition in general, yeah. like you are saying about getting that feedback mm -hmm. and like how you, so, know, you spread the word and advertise them and yeah. everything. Um, a lot of times the BJCP sanctioned competitions are hosted by clubs. I mean, it's not always, it could be by a brewery or what have you, but um, they you know mobilize a team of folks and oftentimes they uh, sign a judge director and then they essentially reach out to their local community to find the BJCP judges that would be interested in um, judging that competition. Oh, awesome. Yeah, and um, they do, you know, all uh, all the categories and then um, once, you know, all the judges arrive at the competition that day, I mean, there's all of these little technicalities like, um, you know, not wearing cologne, yeah, not right. wearing, you know, heavy, don't heavy smoke smell. a cigar before you don't, go. Yeah, <laughs> don't yeah. use pencils that have shavings, just to make sure that the judging experience is very sacred. And um, but anyway, so you know, you, you get in there and you're you're essentially paired up with another judge for your respective category, and you're assigned a category ahead of time. And once um, once you make it to your judging table, you sit down with your judge and uh, you have a steward who um, are very, very crucial in the judging process. And they get the beers lined up and ready to go for your flight. And you start to pour and you go through all of the motions, which starts with appearance and then you move on to aroma and then you move on to flavor and mouth feel and then your overall impression. Each judging score sheet has sections where you can write your notes on just, you know, in the aroma, you're going to talk about the, you know, the, the hop aroma that's been imparted into the beer. Perhaps maybe there's an off flavor, hopefully not. Um, <laughs> uh, and then you, and then each section has a score that you total up at the bottom and then it's on a scale of 13 to 50. So, okay. um, you know. It's really mean to give somebody a third. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to go that far. They get the point. Yeah. <laughs> um, but and and then after you've made it through your entire flight, um, usually the most experienced judge or judges at the table will do a mini best of show, where they essentially choose the shining star of that particular flight, and then you come up with the winner based on the you know top three. Did I awesome. yeah. feel like I covered everything? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And then from like an entrance standpoint, it's it's totally blind. So you'd submit right. a beer, mm -hmm. and when the judges are seeing it, they have no way of knowing you're a number, basically. And okay. you get your score sheet back, and that's how you find out. But you yeah. know, it's, it's very much a... <laughs> it's serious, but it's yeah. also fun. But, you know, for anyone who's looking to up their knowledge of beer or... Um, appreciation or being able to pick out off flavors or pick out specific malts like being a judge is how you get to that point yeah. that's okay and, and like Millie mentioned you know stewarding it starts there you're the it's invaluable experience basically the admin for the judges and then oh, wow. and okay. then you're, you're you're getting points and then you get experience and then you start judging and then there's different levels of being a BJCP judge so what's the, the top level grand uh, it's like well the top level is like grand honorary master but you don't even have to take the exam to get that but yeah it's grand master so and it's it you know it starts um, with provisional judge which is essentially just taking like the online entrance exam which is no small feat it's very technical and um, you know really difficult content so you've got to study for that um, pretty significantly and then after that you move up to um, you'll take what's called the tasting exam or the judging exam and that's an hour and a half long exam where you get um, 15 minutes per beer to judge um, you know they'll tell you what style you're supposed to be judging so they it, you know it's possible they may trick you and say that um, you're supposed to be judging this as if it's a Czech Pilsner but really they put a German Pilsner in front of you um. the old bait and switch oh. <laughs> <laughs> devious yes <laughs> my good yes and then I understand there is uh, or at least it's, uh, I'm trying to think of well, the last time I saw one but a pro-am 
Yeah. At oh, yeah. Great American Beer Fest. Mm-hmm. Is that still a thing that's going on? Yeah. Doing that is a thing. Doing competitions? Yes. Because that sounds like a dream come true. It is the coolest. <laughs> it's <laughs> like <laughs> a, a home brewer's like wildest dream to be part of the Pro-Am. Yeah. So, um, <sighs> The the pro am judging happens usually the week before or the weekend before GABF starts. Um, essentially, they're paired up with breweries um, across the country that these breweries have identified these home brewers recipes as one that they you know see potential in. They're usually like, through like a competition or something. Yeah, okay. like yeah. So a local competition, somebody just nailed it with one of their beers that they submitted. They medaled, and that local brewery decided let's let's you know partner with this home brewer and submit our submit the entry together to Pro Am. And last year, number of entries, I, I think we're over a hundred. Yeah, it's so, growing for sure. So, wow, and. and the style, the range of styles. If you go to Great American Beer Festival, like that should definitely be on your stop. Oh yeah. Up the floor oh yeah. Because it's it's so it's you know ninety to hundred uh, entries each session of GABF. They have thirty different ones. So if you're going to every day, you're gonna have a different selection. Oh of wow. Thirty beers. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's cool. Sh- like some of them are getting crazy and doing like really you know um, uh, remote or uh, historical styles. Mm-hmm. Like one year, Lichtenheiner or one third place. Yeah. Um, so it's one of the best booths to hit at Great American Beer, oh, Beer Festival. That sounds sure. fantastic. And like as a home brewer, you're brewing with like your your idols, right? right? And in some cases, like I know Stone, they, they do a homebrew competition every year. That's a pro am, and a lot of the beers that have won their competition, they've gone on to package. So oh like, yeah. Oh wow. I'm gonna butcher the name. I know. But the I Zoka, have... Zoka Vesa Stout, which is kind of like a Mexican, Mexican style chocolate, chocolate stout. Ooh, that beautiful. started as a homebrew winner four or five years ago, and you can get that in four packs at your liquor store mm-hmm. now. So awesome. like, it doesn't end at GABF for some of these. Like this is becoming a a tap room essential. Yeah, and they might do like really awesome release parties to celebrate these home brewers recipes and. I mean, it's just hard to really describe how exciting that is for <laughs> and from, the, from the professional perspective, they're all stoked to be, you know, kind of, I guess giving back's a good word for it, but interacting with homebrewers because 99% of these guys and girls started as homebrewers. And, right. you know, it's not like, hey, we're not homebrewers anymore. We're never talking to you right. again. This is their way of, you know, supporting. They recognize that, you know, homebrewers were some of the the most uh, passionate beer drinkers, and we're the people who are willing to drive across the country to like, go to <laughs> different like, places. A million and, breweries. You know, all of our vacations yeah. are based around going to breweries and things like that. So you know, the, the synergy of the home brewer and the craft brewer is like one of my favorite parts about working here. Is like we don't feel like we're like the we're the, we're just the hobby guys. Like no, like we're very much. Uh, a, a complementary group to the to the commercial. I side mean, and what you meet the home brewers too. I mean, it's oh yeah, very funky passionate. Oh, oh yeah. my goodness, yeah. But it's like the community aspect has been huge though. So all of the, like the breweries we go to, one of the big three common threads that we see is it's a, a shift away from. I'm trying to think like j- binge culture. Sure. About you know this isn't the, like the place we go specifically. I'm talking about Parsons North in Columbus. Um, and Minor in South Dakota, yeah. and Catabatic in Montana, Gagan Brothers in Maine, Isla Mirada Beer Company in Florida. One of the main things they like to say is, is like, you come here, we want you to come enjoy the beer. And most of them, the tap rooms are 100% kid and family friendly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because they, and Nate actually give credit where credit's due from Parsons North. That he's like, maybe this will be a thing where they'll show the kids. You don't have to drink to get drunk. You right. can come here and have, because they even sell liquor in their tap room, but no shots. Like you yeah. can get a nice, like an old fashioned, mm-hmm. a couple fingers on the rocks, mm-hmm. but you, this is not a place for that activity. Right. Right. You're here to enjoy some things. And then the second big thread we found was just the community spirit. Oh yeah. That thing where, okay, this brewery just opened and we ran out of two row. We'll right. Call somebody I've never even met. A mile away and they'll be like yeah absolutely we'll send a guy down or or just yeah just come up and grab it mm-hmm. yeah and is the home brewers the exact same mentality from the 99 percent of what we've seen totally 
I think it's rooted in just taking pride in what you what you make and savoring the flavor and you know taking a moment to like really enjoy what you're having as opposed to just you know like guzzling right. <laughs> guzzling beer at every stop you know I mean and a lot of times craft breweries and you know home brewers have some really elaborate setups they're there's creating an experience you know they, they want you to come in and sit down I mean you know, we're going over to our boss's house this Saturday for a brew day and we're just <laughs> gonna hang out and you know brew beer <laughs> so what a job <laughs> and that uh, uh, switching gears a bit a little um lobbying mm -hmm. specifically we already touched on yeah. it as far as getting that homebrew thing moving forward from that now let me just clarify all 50 states it is legal to homebrew now the Correct. 2013 were the last yep. to jump on board yep so moving forward what do you see as like the big push uh, for yeah, as far as legislation and sure. things like that for home brewers, I, we kind of generalize them as fair, saying fair use laws. Okay. So, kind of again, practical things that you probably assume are already legal, and you're like, how is this possibly not okay for me to do? Those are the things we're going after. So it's mostly dealing with transportation. So where you're allowed to bring things, how you're allowed to bring them, and how much you're allowed to take, as well as. Um, Sort sampling, sampling is a big one. And also uh, uh, location. So like a lot of homebrew clubs, they'll meet at the same brewery the first Thursday of every month, or they'll meet at a homebrew shop. Right. And in some states, if uh, a brewery, you know, they obviously have a beer license, well, they can't bring any off-premise off -premise beer onto their, uh, and, in, onto their premise. And similarly with the homebrew shop, you know, most homebrew shops do educational courses where they're um, serving or excuse me brewing beer but not every homebrew shop can then sample and serve that beer because they may not be licensed to you know serve beer on premise wow but uh, you, you mentioned it earlier and I think it's a great point of it's kind of a delicate balance of trying to make a change that's going to benefit everyone but at the same time you know if if things are going okay and it might not be explicitly said that you can share a beer with Millie, but it's happening and, you know, that's the way it's going. It's like, do you want to bring attention to that? So it's it's very much like we're, we're very, very careful about yeah. how quickly we rush into things, who's involved, because you might think like, hey, don't you want 10,000 people all, you know, emailing this one person right away? It's like, well, we right. need to have a unified tactical approach. approach in order to actually get something done because if it doesn't get done in the timeline, you're starting all over right. the next yeah. year. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so very accurate. Uh, just... Yeah, and we have, we have uh, you know, Gary, our director is very, very involved. And we have another staffer, John Moorhead, who's kind of our, our head for the legislative kind of efforts, but, you know, it's, it's a non-stop kind of thing, and he's working on um, efforts with five or six states at any one yeah. time. Oh, wow. And there's, you know, people constantly. queued up. Yeah, there's always something to be working on. And we're a seven-person staff, so it's not like we can travel to all yeah, of these right. states that <laughs> right. have these issues. So we also have a governing committee that's elected by our members, and they, oh, they can be very instrumental in this, too. Yes. You know, they are ambassadors to the, the hobby, and people know, you know, they're almost like homebrew celebrities. People know who they are, that they represent the membership for the AHA and inform our decisions as a staff. So they get, they'll get involved as well mm -hmm. and help us move the needle on some of these issues too we've been talking on the way up here about one of the uh, the gc member and trying to get the conference in yeah you know, or is ohio and yeah. general, right yeah. so you know someone might have a specific situation where they know their local homebrew community is being stifled by a specific law so in this case a state that wants to host uh homebrew con our annual uh homebrewers conference they can't because the lo the laws aren't allowing uh, the pouring of homebrew in these conference locations. So mm -hmm. in order for us to get there, we have to work on laws. And, you know, that's a great sort of, those are the kind of things that trigger like, okay, that's a good area of focus. There's a lot of desire. There's a lot of need. And if we don't do it, there's potential that this could um, harm the homebrewing community almost. Right. And you just led me straight into my next question, okay. which was <laughs> BrewCon. Yeah. <laughs> Coming up. Providence, yeah, just, yeah, Rhode Island. Like, right now, I was just saying, let's pump it up. What's yeah, going yeah. on? Yeah. yeah. 
give us the breakdown. <laughs> yeah, just, who, who gets rock, to do it? Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> well, if you can't tell, we're excited. Yes, just um, a little. <laughs> well, so the, again, like this is the event for homebrewers for the year. And we are looking at taking over Providence, Rhode Island this mm. summer. And it's a small city. So when, you know, ho hopefully close to 3,000 homebrewers are going to be flooding into those streets. And they're all there to have fun, but there's tons of educational, I mean, the, the purpose of the conference is that we have seminars and people learn, but we have all these cool events that we do at night as well, um, like our craft beer kickoff party. Club night is just not to be missed. It's the coolest thing. Yeah. So, yeah, you can I talk, talk about yeah. club night? It's, it's literally my favorite thing. You have my beer full related. attention. So, <laughs> so each, each night is like a different sort of beer festival. The middle night is, is uh, club night. So people are members of homebrew clubs across the country. They'll register, so usually it's anywhere from like 70 to 80 or 50 to 80 clubs. They'll sign up and they'll build a booth and they'll usually have a theme of some sort. Um, and booths will pour anywhere from like six to 12 beer, meads and ciders. And awesome. usually there's live music playing also and awesome. people are dressed up in costumes, costumes, but it is just an absolute blast. And you know, it's beer, mead and cider and it's home brewers. So the, the like, the array of styles. I had a, uh, I had a, a Mountain Dew mead one year. I had a <laughs> corn, a corned beef Kolsch. I've had, yeah, and like this, it sounds gnarly, but you take a sip and you're like, okay, this corned beef Kolsch has, yeah. you know, the, the spices. It's just not actually beef in it, but then, you know, all the spices that went into it, you're like this is kind of working. So yeah. you're kind of definitely taking ten steps outside of your comfort zone. <laughs> and finding all these awesome beers and meeting some really, really crazy people and <laughs> passionate you know, home brewers dressed up as cows. They can't wait to share their and... beers with you. I mean, <laughs> they're walking around. I mean, and the themes too are just so the cool. Like awesome. the boots, like one last year, I think it was last year, it was Game of Thrones theme mm -hmm. and they were running their draft lines through an ice block. Yeah. <laughs> like an ice sculpture. An so. ice sculpture. Yeah. It's pretty sweet. <laughs> really, really cool. Or but there, yeah. yeah, there is one that was Oregon Trail themed, themed last year. You could literally have an interaction experience mm -hmm. with your beer maybe you got scurvy you're off the trail yeah. you know, like. <laughs> yes but we haven't been in, we haven't been in new england since 91 for the yeah. conference oh, wow. so, so this is big. it's it's yeah we're very excited to bring it back you know very easy to get to if you're in new england i'm from that area i'm from boston so i'm i'm excited to be back in the old from baltimore grounds. won't hold that against you <laughs> <laughs> but well, uh, what and are the tons of like breweries and businesses are really excited for this too mm -hmm. so oh, yeah. you know providence isn't going to be the only place to go i mean right. we're, we're kind of telling our members like make this a trip brewing right like go to the new england conference yeah because <laughs> that was when i was at situate massachusetts yeah. it's untold brewing up there okay um Great, great little place. Yeah. Like, uh, amazing beers, really, again, but everybody we meet at breweries is usually cool. Right. These guys were also very cool. <laughs> surprise, uh, surprise. I know, it's like, oh, and one of them, uh, I think Kyle is from Colorado. Oh, cool. Oh. And I don't know, oh, if there's, if you listen to the podcast, cnfltd.com, we'll get you the links there. Um, and you'll hear his story about bouncing around the country and then landing in situate. But uh, yeah, I was, I'm just trying to think, I wonder, because if you're heading up that way, oh, yeah. so many great breweries in the area. Oh, yeah. and. It's not like it's a. It's, if you're already there, getting to Connecticut so or easy. Massachusetts is. I mean, it's. it's Forty-five like, minute train. We're, we're like all that. flying into Boston, and so like you'll be yeah. able. To, and it's like a forty-five minute drive from Boston to Providence, and I grew up south of Boston. Like Trillium is right in between there and yeah. Providence. How convenient! Like there's a lot <laughs> right. you can do just in the forty-five minute drive from Boston to Providence. Never mind if you want to take a little detour, but right. New England. It's so small. Mm -hmm. I'm like, we live in Colorado. It's a pretty big state. So, right. like, you can Lots do of all of space. New England <laughs> uh, in the day, uh, uh, yeah. in Colorado. And Portsmouth's not too far away. Nope. It's definitely yeah. worth the trip there. I, mean, I went up to Portsmouth and visited some breweries, got some to participate in our member deals program. So, oh, that's so another really great thing for our members is like, we've also been scouting out breweries in the area to offer discounts to yeah. our members, too. So, yeah, I don't know if you know that we do AHA member deals. It's 2100 discounts at like breweries and homebrew shops and Fantastic. It's one of our premier benefits yeah. i mean you can pay for your membership you know many times over with the amount of money if you're really you know out drinking beer at breweries yeah. that often um i mean one of our colleagues he saved 160 dollars in six months, in six months. Yeah. like buck off pints 20 percent off your full <laughs> 
ticket, you know, all sorts of mm -hmm. stuff like Worth that. Worth every penny. Right. <laughs> so when we have a homebrew con, every penny. We, you know, we focus on that area, so we make sure that all the attendees, you know, if they're outside of the conference or they're taking some time off, they can go somewhere and grab a beer, support a local watering hole, and save a few bucks while they're doing it. And what are the dates for the con? 27, June 27th through the 29th. Yep. So last weekend in June. Excellent. Which is the summer in New England. Oh, it's going to be gorgeous. Yeah. Can't wait. Oh, no tragedy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <right. laughs> yeah, head to Cape Cod for 4th of July right after that. Oh, be a nice yeah. little vacation. Mm -hmm. Challenge accepted, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we do, the, we do the, the festivals at night, daytimes usually. We have a big brew expo, so all the... Um, Newest. newest, coolest gear and ingredients and, and stuff's in there. Of course, beer's being poured in there as well. And then we're ha we have 50 to 60 educational seminars. So that's anything from um, maybe like a really deep dive on one specific historic style or okay. something on, you know, we do a lot of alternative fermentation stuff. So mead cider, maybe something on pickling or yeah, something like that. Other Ooh. fermentables. And awesome. then there's panels too. So there might be like a, hey, I want to go pro. I'm going to go listen to this panel with five guys who were home brewers and they're at different stages in their professional careers. And they kind of give you a look and and how to make that jump. But um, there is definitely a little of everything for someone. And then after the conference, we put all those uh, recordings of the seminar up on homebrewersassociation.org, homebrewersassociation.org, um, for members to access. So any member has access to past seminars through 2012 is when we started recording them. Awesome. Yeah, so that's like, that and the Zymergy archive are like such a say, huge So you could just go nerd out for hours. Yeah, oh, days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are days, we doing tonight right. again? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have 300 hours of seminars to watch, my friend. <laughs> oh, I can't accept another challenge. <laughs> so wait, um, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm just like, oh, that's a lot of hours yeah. <laughs> of material. We yeah. also have an industry track at homebrew con which is pretty cool too so i mean there's the expo and uh, you know folks in the industry homebrew industry are able to showcase all of their products and that sort of thing but something totally separate too is just that we have information available to businesses that sell to homebrewers and um i think that's a nice little extra component that um the industry can take advantage of too do you have to be a member to attend the con yes you do, you do. Yeah. so how can those watching and listening right now become members so they can go to this magical conference that you're having? Sure. <laughs> uh, if you go to homebrewersassociation.org, there's going to be homebrewersassociation.org. Home Home um, there will be all sorts of join buttons uh, floating around on that homepage. No subtlety there. Uh, lots of subtlety there. That's my job. And uh, uh, if you don't see any of those, let me know. And then, and then also uh, there's the membership section in the navigation, and there will be all sorts of join uh, options under there. Um, if you just go to the homebrewcon.org, that's the conference website. Awesome. Uh, it'll also kind of walk you through how to become a member before you register if you're not already a member. So super easy. It starts at 38 bucks a year for a digital membership. Okay. Um, so that gets you six issues of the magazine, access to uh, all the Zymergy archive, the homebrewcon seminars archive, National Homebrew Competition gold medal recipes through 2004. Awesome. Uh, access to events like AHA rallies. So that's where we have little uh, brewery get togethers uh, across the country. Member deals. Member, member deals. deals. My favorite thing. So much many yep. member deals. Yep. And then I get, I'm trying to think, wow. Just, I'm like, not, okay, I'm gonna go register now because I don't know why I'm not already. This is a whole yes. other conversation. Sounds like you got enough breweries. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> once, or, once or twice, you know, yeah. sample. So, Brent, homebrewer.org. Homebrewersassociation.org. Boom. There Boom. you go. And if you're on social media, we're homebrew associ. So, homebrewers association, but without the I A T I O N at the end on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Yes. Make sure you smash that like button. The usual smash, smash that, that like button. button. Keep comments. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and then finally, yes. If you could say anything, or just give one piece of advice, maybe to those out there who are thinking about getting into home brewing yeah. or thinking of joining the organization to find out more about it, what would you tell them? I'll go first. Sure. <laughs> um, well, if you're thinking about it, you should probably just try it, first of all. Um, and of course, joining the AHA is the first step because it pretty much supplies you with all of the knowledge that you need. But in general, I would just say, you know, don't be afraid of it. It's not as technical as some, maybe some people, you know, perceive it to be. 
there are, you know, really fun hobby homebrewers who don't take it too seriously, and then you've got the really nerdy technical ones, all of which are women too, just <laughs> should mention that. So, um, you know, I'd say don't be afraid to give it a try. There's a lot of different techniques you can do as a, as a novice homebrewer, and you'll be surprised how quickly you get hooked on it. I was going to say something similar. It's like if you go on forums and whatnot and you see someone who's been brewing for 10 years and they have this big shiny stainless steel system, you might be like, there's no way in hell I will ever be able to one, afford that or to get to a level where I feel like I need that. I brew in what I call a primitive way. So I use one five gallon pot. I have a couple mesh bags and that's all I need. And I do it all on a burner. So like Millie said, if there's a will, there's a way. So if you want to make beer, um, you can absolutely do it. We say if you can make soup or if you can make oatmeal, mm -hmm. you can essentially make beer. Um, True. And everything you need to know from like the simplest way to the most complicated way to make beer, we have tutorials on homebrewersassociation.org that will like literally walk you through step by step and we, yeah. we hold your hand. We have videos and all that stuff. So if you're thinking about it, do it. You're going to love it. And then you're going to keep doing it. it becomes an out of control <laughs> hobby really yes. fast. Yes. <laughs> Hide your credit card. <laughs> Millie, Duncan, thank you so much. Thank this you. was yeah. an awesome day, awesome city, awesome town. I think now it's time for us to go hit some breweries. Yeah. So yes. again, thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks and for having everybody us. out there watching and listening, thank you very much. And we'll Woo! see you on the next stop later. CNF Worldwide for nomads everywhere. This broadcast was produced by CNF Limited for nomads everywhere. The contents of this broadcast are the property of CNF Limited. All rights are reserved. For more information about CNF publications, contact us at 305-707-4024. Find us on the web at cnfltd.com.